This video has been a disaster. My original plan was to use my old Ryzen 2 200G system, which has built-in graphics, and to compare how fast that is against how the system performs with a Radeon 6500 XT in it. I thought this would have been a great way to see what sort of performance boost an older system would receive if you slot a new graphics card into it, which I suspect a lot of people on old or dying PCs might have to do. But then my 2200G processor died, and I really didn't know what to do then, having already sunk a few days into this project. So this video will cover the results I got from that processor before it failed on me. This is not going to be your usual benchmarking video, because I have nothing to compare these results to, so it's going to be me running this PC through a series of games and telling you how I feel they perform, to see if a 6500 XT will bring these older systems into the modern era, or if it's time to upgrade the CPU as well. I feel that this is an undercovered topic. Everybody, rightly, benchmarks new graphics cards on newer systems. But I lack the resources to compete with these kinds of reviewers, and honestly I think a video series where I test it on older stuff might actually be more interesting anyway, because I always love the tale of an underdog. The Ryzen 2200G. This is sort of like a 4-core first gen Ryzen, but with a few tweaks and with amazing onboard graphics for the time. This is about equivalent to an old 4-core i5, which people on a mid-range PC from between 2011 and 2017 might still be using. And the graphics card is about equivalent to a $200 graphics card from 2016. So all in all, the buying situation now is similar to how it was 6 years ago, only these days you'll get a better processor for less money, and probably PCIe 4 support, which I won't have the luxury of in this video. We'll start with a demanding older game, just to show you what this system can do. Deus Ex Mankind Divided is probably one of the toughest games from 2016. It's one of those games that will destroy performance if you ramp everything up to highest, so there's not much point in going much beyond high preset. But I will anyway, for science. So at the high preset at 1080p, the game's benchmark averaged out above 60fps. It sometimes went up to the 80s, though there were segments where it dropped to the 50s. For a game like Deus Ex, I would still call this playable. It seemed to tax the GPU and CPU similarly, and both regularly reached 90% utilisation or more. So actually a 4-core processor is quite a good match for the graphics card in this game. Also, check out these watts. Apparently the 6500XT is using about 80, and the CPU is hovering around 30, which is incredible efficiency, if true. But this maybe should be expected, since the chip inside the 6500XT is intended for laptops. I next tried low preset, which performed a bit better, but still dropped below 60fps in places, and looked a lot worse. So I wouldn't bother dropping to low preset in this game, on this sort of system. Ramping everything up to ultra warns me that it would use more than 4GB of VRAM, which you'd expect would cripple the 6500XT, but it still averaged 48fps, and while I wouldn't recommend playing it like that, the performance wasn't as crippled as I would have expected it to be given the circumstances. Just go play Mankind Divided at high preset and know that a CPU upgrade is just as relevant as a GPU one. Doom Eternal is a more recent title, and requires higher frame rates in order to be playable, so I admit I was curious to know how this ageing system would handle in this title. It also has ray tracing support, but this was sadly greyed out, as was anything above high preset. So this is the game putting a hard block on the 6500XT's 4GB of VRAM, and I'm disappointed because I'd still like to try it just to see how badly it performs, but I guess we'll just have to use our imaginations. As it turns out, this block was probably for the best. The PC had no problem running low preset at more than 100fps. It felt extremely smooth and playable, and didn't appear to struggle at all. But going up to just medium crashed the frame rate down to about 60fps, which I wouldn't consider to be optimal in this title, and the performance seemed heavily dependent on the direction my character was facing, so it wasn't stable at all. And this was the biggest issue. Looking through the footage I got on medium settings, a lot of the time was spent at 70 or 80fps but I simply couldn't trust this PC to remain smooth when I needed it to, as it would drop to 60 or even a bit below that when the action hotted up, or simply when I turned and looked in a certain direction. And upping it to high preset made things even worse, bringing it down to about 30fps, which was unacceptable. And again, when I say 30fps, a lot of the time was spent closer to 60fps or even above that. But Doom Slayer Guy deserves better. Doom Eternal is a game I've always deemed to be a highly optimised title, but on minimum spec components it's evident how rapidly performance can drop off once limits are reached. Whether the limits in this case are CPU or GPU, we'll figure out later on, as I will be repeating this testing with more powerful processors to see if the extra threads help. I found the home hub to be particularly demanding, despite there being nothing there that was trying to eat my face. You can see that high preset drops the frame rate to under 40fps, with the game indicating that it's being GPU limited, but I'll definitely like to compare this with what the Radeon 480 can manage in the same situation, because it could be here that the 6500XT's limited bandwidth or VRAM is seriously gimping its performance in this particular area. 
So all in all, I'm very pleased that I tested Doom Eternal because it will be interesting to see how performance scales as I switch CPUs and GPUs around. Shadow of War is a weird game. I remember it looking amazing when it came out in 2017, but looking at it today, it looks decidedly dated, showing just how far open world games have come in the last five years. If you want to know why this video took so long to make, it's because most of the games I tested were about 60 gigabytes in size, but Shadow of War for some reason is 150, which takes a huge amount of time for me to download on my 60 megabit connection, and then to shuffle my games around between the hard drive and the main SSD for the testing. Not that this mattered at all, even on an SSD, the frame rates in this title remained inconsistent. I was quite proud of this little comparison that I made, which shows that all settings ran smoothly, apart from Ultra, which suffered from quite a lot of stuttering earlier on in the benchmark. High and Very High both have one long stutter, but at different spots and I don't fully know why, but it will certainly mess up their minimums. The general performance of all the presets I tested seemed to pick up as the benchmark progressed, even during the large battle scene towards the end, which is where you'd expect performance to be the worst. Whether we're being CPU or GPU limited depends on whether you go by the benchmarks figures or from the AMD performance chart down the side. I'd say this game challenges both, but it does look like High, Very High and Ultra all make quite a lot of use of the 6500 XT's power. So maybe it's a bit disappointing that Shadow of War presents a challenge for this graphics card, but when I look up benchmarks of the game online, this card's performance falls roughly where you'd expect it to be. Guru3D shows the Radeon 480 and 570 averaging 52 FPS at ultra settings, so actually the 6500 XT is comparable with these, despite me using a less capable CPU and likely running into more bandwidth limitations. The 6500 XT's performance still falls short of the Radeon 580 and GeForce 1060 though, and way behind Vega and higher tier GeForce 1000 series cards. I feel it's only fair that the 6500XT gets another chance at this game when paired with a more capable processor than the 2200G, as it may improve its results further, but on this particular setup, I'd recommend sticking to very high preset, or even just high, for that little bit of extra performance leeway. And the last game I tested was Far Cry 5, which was when I finally had the awesome idea of comparing the 6500XT with the 2200G's built-in graphics, which I was then going to test in all the other titles as well. Yes, it took me too long to realise that I should be doing this, and I immediately saw how hardware reviewers could get paranoid. There I was benchmarking these things when I saw this game was maxing out the 2200G's default usage of 2GB of VRAM, and I knew that people would call me out for this if I didn't increase this to a higher value. So I went into the BIOS, I upped the maximum to 3GB, and my PC never turned on again. RIP 2200G. I'm still not sure what I did wrong, but changing this value in the BIOS will be another irrational fear I have moving forward. Still, I did manage to get a few results before this happened. So without the 6500XT and using only the 2200G's built-in graphics, at low setting 720p it still managed a rather acceptable 43fps average and 38fps minimum, but at 1080p resolution this dropped to 22 average. Slotting a 6500XT into the system only increased this to 57fps, which means the 6500XT wasn't even three times faster than the built-in graphics. But the graphics card isn't at fault here. Looking at the stats, we can see that it's very CPU limited at these settings. So although we're not even managing 60 FPS in this game, it makes sense to try and increase the settings since the 6500XT still apparently has a lot of performance overhead. High still ran at 53 FPS, which is hardly a drop at all. And then something incredible happened. Ramping everything up to ultra settings actually increased frame rates to 71 FPS, returning the best result I got in this game. What's going on? I can only assume that Ultra Settings offloads more of the work from the CPU onto the GPU instead, resulting in a weird situation where the game works better at high settings than it does at low. But yeah, I got the highest frame rate in this game at the highest graphic settings. It's so ridiculous that I would have retested it, had my CPU not died on me. The last thing I attempted was the HD textures, which, on the menu, appeared to max out the 6500XT's 4GB of VRAM. It still managed 57fps average, same as at low preset, but it stuttered from time to time, so I wouldn't want to play on these settings. In conclusion, a bit of a silly video, because typically when you're benchmarking something, you either want a CPU or GPU bottleneck, and not a bit of both at the same time, which is the opposite of when you're trying to play a game, because ideally then you'd like both of them to be a bit bottlenecked, because then that means your PC is balanced. But is this system balanced? Is the Radeon 6500 XT a good match for an older 4-core Ryzen? I think that completely depends on the game that you're playing, and the settings you're using. This rig could certainly run every game I throw at it, so far, but interestingly, none of them maxed out settings, even though most of them are already a few years old. I don't think this really matters for these titles, with the exception of Doom Eternal, which I don't like having to run at low preset, but it bodes worse for future ones. I feel like with GPU bottlenecks you can always drop the settings and resolutions if you have to, 
but if a CPU isn't up to the task, then there's not a lot you can do besides overclocking it. I'll be honest, beyond the fastest processes, I think 4 cores are on the way out, and I'm kind of happy that I'll be doing the bulk of this low budget testing with 8 threads instead of 4. Consoles have had more than 4 cores for a long time, and I really would feel more comfortable with the 1500X's 8 threads, or better still, a 6 core CPU of some kind. But like you probably already know, the 6500XT is not without fault. I think the HD texture packs are already pushing into its limited 4GB of VRAM, and Doom Eternal's awful FPS drop-off beyond low settings might be highlighting its limited memory bandwidth, but it's not really fair to call it unplayable when it's pushing literally hundreds of FPS at low settings. I'm especially looking forward to trying games like Red Dead Redemption 2, Control, Crisis and Cyberpunk, which are all notoriously demanding in one way or another. If I had to guess, I'd say that Cyberpunk will punish this card the most, while the rest I'm expecting will scale better at lower presets. I am really sad that my 2200G died on me, because I didn't get the chance to compare onboard graphics in games versus the 6500 XT, which I think really would have been fascinating. From some of the comments I've seen, I get the impression that some of you think the gap between the 6500 XT's performance and that of APUs is smaller than it actually is. Now, I'm not dismissing APUs as being viable gaming machines, provided you're happy gaming on sub 1080p resolutions. I have, after all, spent years shouting about how great a 2200G was in an ultra-budget build. As Elzamo92 says, if your whole computer needs an upgrade, then something like a 5600G could tide you over as an all-in-one system, but for gaming performance, the 6500XT would still be a big jump over that. And there is definitely an audience out there that has a CPU that's still good enough for gaming, where spending £200 on a 6500XT makes more upgrading sense than having to buy a whole new system and an overpriced graphics card on top of that. As far as APUs go, if you already have a 2200G then I don't see another one out there that's worth upgrading to, at least not for better GPU performance. Something like a 5600G would be a major CPU upgrade, but ultimately it's still stuck using Vega cores for the graphics. And while it's better, it's not that much better. The big leap in APUs will come with the Steam Deck, which finally switches from using Vega to Navi cores, and it utilises the system's fast RAM to unlock its full potential. Yet I still expect the 6500XT to outperform that by considerable margin, all thanks to its greater core numbers and clock speeds. So returning to the 2200G, the 6500XT significantly boosted frame rates in the one game I managed to test it on before it died. In Far Cry 5, moving from onboard graphics to the 6500XT was a jump from 40fps at 720p low settings to 70fps at 1080p ultra settings. That's a really nice upgrade for anybody currently struggling on an older system. And I'll answer a few other questions I've received too, because you've all helped me to identify the sort of questions that people have about this sort of hardware. I'm not sure if Mankind's comment was intended as a joke, but I can assure him that the 6500XT should be able to handle Half-Life 2 very well. I've tried to find the most demanding titles I can from every year, and while there will always be exceptions, the 6500XT should comfortably max out any game from 2015 or before. And as you can see, it is still achieving smooth performance at high settings in newer games as well, as you'd hope for from a card released in 2022. Moving on to a Gina's comment about performance being worse in PCI 3, well firstly I'm testing in PCI 3, and secondly, like I've said before, even at PCI 3 the 6500XT seems competitive with other $200 cards, it's just that with PCI 4 it pulls ahead of them. Joker 345172's suggestion to benchmark games per year formed the backbone of my game selection. Believe me, I have more and more demanding titles planned, and would have tested it already had my 2200G not gone bye-bye. I can assure you though that I'll be running the 6500XT through far more gruelling titles in future videos, and I can't wait to hear this thing scream. Fierce Vinegar implied that I was making these videos to try and make my money back that I spent buying this card, and he's 100% right. And lastly, I'd like to address something I've noticed going on. Please don't try to start fights between YouTubers by taking stuff out of context and then by going to other YouTubers being all like, so and so said this, which disagrees with what you say. So I'll just say it now, I have nothing against tech YouTubers and don't want forced rivalries and drama with them. It seems to be a thing these days for people to want fights between everybody and I simply don't have the time for that sort of nonsense. I'm perfectly happy for tech YouTubers with all the gear to do their own thing and to do it better than I can, and I'm perfectly happy in my own little corner of the internet making videos that I like to think are a guilty pleasure for them to watch. But maybe that's just one of my weird fantasies. And with that out of the way, on to my future plans with the 6500XT. It's done ray tracing at 60fps. It's been paired with the 2200G. Now I'm going to put it with a slightly more capable 1500X and to run it through the whole series of games that I intended to test in the first place, as well as to revisit problem titles like Doom Eternal. And then I'll jump onto a newer system to compare the 6500 XT against the Radeon 480. At least, that's the plan right now. Depends on whether any of my other components choose to fail on me before then.